Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is none other than the man, the myth, and the legend behind California balsamic vinegars, my favorite brand of balsamics. We had the doctor on earlier today talking about how much he likes balsamic vinegar in general and Tommy's flavors in particular. And every month he makes recipes that are submitted by you, the viewer. If chosen, you win a free bottle and the flavor of your choice might even be two bottles. And this month's flavor is the wild huckleberry. It's one of the newer flavors. It's very unique. And he's going to be making three recipes, including a wild huckleberry pudding and a wild huckleberry oat. Please welcome Tommy Balsamic. How are you? Good afternoon, Chef. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Hey, I want to let you know, here's a quick shout out from one of your favorite places, Chef. I'm wearing my uh, Puerta... Rancho, Rancho, Rancho La Puerta. Puerta. My darling bride, Ethel, um, was there along with her friend, Victoria, who was teaching um, massage at there. So Ethel went as Victoria's guest about three years ago, and they brought me back this beautiful shirt, which I thought would oh, be appropriate thing to wear because it's cold outside today in the rain. So I thought that would be cute and you'd appreciate that. Oh, very nice. Very nice. I love it. Well, you know, I would say long time no see because you come on once a month, but I actually did just see you. It was a wonderful time at Victoria's, um, or no, uh, was it Valerie's? Valeria. Um, Valeria, yes, yes, yes. We went to her Valeria, home for a depending on how you pronounce it. Yeah. Yep. A uh, potluck um, at her place in uh, outside of Sacramento, and the costumes were absolutely wonderful. I, I think there were about thirty-five people there, something like that. And they really went all out with their costumes, didn't they? And it was just so much fun seeing uh, Al Schmidt in his uh, Roman emperor outfit. And there were two or three policemen. And uh, and one of the policemen there, a nice young lady, had a name tag on. And it had her, her name uh, there was Pat You Down. <laughs> <laughs> she won, too. Yeah, that was precious. Yeah. <laughs> that was so cute. Uh, and... and um, and a young lady who we're going to see in a couple of weeks at one of the festivals um, uh, was there as, oh, she had her kale outfit on, which was just so cute. Um, so anyway, that was a lot of fun seeing every Kathy Wynn was, was there and she had on her kale outfit. Oh, yeah. So. She, she came in second. It was such a close contest. That was really yep. An adorable outfit. And if people want to see the photos, just join our local meetup group and that's where they're posted. You know, back in the old days when I did my singing telegrams, I had my Christmas tree outfit on, which I was a little bit much to wear for that kind of deal. Ethel and I, as you remember, were uh, playing cards and I was the six of diamonds and Ethel was the five of clubs. And those were quick and easy. And those uh, uh, the outfits, costumes were made by her mother 45 years ago. So that's got some some long long longevity to that. So anyway, that was a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you for inviting me, Chef. Well, you know, I always so. said, Thomas, you're a real card. You should be dealt ah. with. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fine. Uh, it, normally I would say, hey, I'll do the jokes around here, but uh, I... I, I give it up to the queen. Anybody who's been on Carson three times, you, I bow to you. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. So Huckleberry, that was, Huckleberry is one of the, what, that was that released this year or, the, or last year? No, just a few months ago. Uh, it's, it's, brand, it's brand new here, uh, probably in June this year. And now for those of you who don't know huckleberries, they're primarily only grown in the Pacific Northwest, Northern Oregon, all of Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And they're small little berries, uh, look like small blueberries, and they're hard to pick and they're extremely expensive and they're outrageously delicious. So if you're driving anywhere through the Pacific Northwest throughout the summer months, you'll see signs for huckleberries 
everywhere. And they're making huckleberry jams, huckleberry syrups, huckleberry this, huckleberry that. And it's just huckleberry crazy for about three months. And then they're gone and the signs disappear and huckleberry season is over till next year. So, but if you can find them, get some because they are delicious. Wow. Anyway, um, let's see other fun things. I'm going to see you again, chef, in a couple more weeks. I know um, the Harvest Festival. I'm really excited. We're going to go to the Harvest Festival in San Mateo this weekend, uh, November 8th, 9th, and 10th at the Event Center. And we'll be, uh, Ethel and I will be there for that one. And then the following weekend at Cal Expo, we'll be there the 18th, 19th, and 20th um, at that event. So, Oh, the oh, 11, okay. This weekend is the 11th through the 13th uh, there. And then the Cal Expo show, we're in booth 805. So if anybody there who lives in the greater Sacramento area wants to see Chef AJ, uh, she'll be in our booth 805 uh, at uh, 10 o'clock when the doors open up at uh, Cal Expo. So come on down and get her autograph. It'll be worth lots of money in the future. <laughs> Nice. Maybe not. Maybe not. But it's fun to say. Eight oh five is the booth number, not the time. That is correct. Our, we're in booth number eight oh five. We've been in that booth for ooh fifteen, eighteen years now. Same booth. People know where we are. The longtime regular customers, they know where we are, and they come see us every year. So that's a it's a beautiful event, and they really have high quality arts and crafts. You know, hey, they've got us there, so it's a good, it's a great event for anybody who's in the Sacramento area. Yeah, so, how how many vendors would you estimate that they have at that? Pre-COVID, there were probably 250 vendors pre-COVID, but post-COVID, that number is a lot smaller. I imagine it's closer to 150, uh, something like that. Now, hopefully, there'll be, be a little bit more because a lot of vendors who were older last year in 21, they were not comfortable going to events where there was going to be, you know. 15,000 people there over the whole weekend. So many vendors either retired or just said, I'm going to take the 2021 off and they didn't go to it. So the whole industry has had a, a, a real shift because people either retired or went out of business because without festivals for a year and a half, many companies just went out of business, which is a shame. Um, so uh, but the people who did go uh, were very pleased uh, just because it's a great event. So hopefully they'll be closer to 200 this year. I got to think there'll be a little bit more uh, every year. So we'll, well see. I, I mentioned to you that I went to a local craft fair this weekend that was very well attended. And I hope you'll come to my neck of the woods next year and be in that fair. Uh, we definitely will. We're going to contact since I remember seeing the text that you sent me, I'll contact the Chamber of Commerce and find out exactly who runs it and see if we can't get in next year because that's a those are fun events to do that are local and uh, and we'll we'll try to do it. So all good, Jeff. All good. Great. Okay. So to start off, the very first recipe we have here is called Wild Huckleberry and Blueberry Oats. And it's from our friend Rita Rosenlieb. And I want to do a shout out to Rita. She's been uh, giving us recipes for a long time now. And I want to thank her for doing that because her recipes are always good. Now, um, it's super simple doing the oats in a jar. And, um, and these are... Uh, pint jars. We didn't double the recipe. Uh, we just made them half size just because we like these jars. They're easy to use, easy to shake up at the beginning. So one third of a cup of unsweetened apple juice, a teaspoon of our wild huckleberry balsamic, a teaspoon of vanilla, a tablespoon of chia seeds, a third of a cup of blueberries. You can use fresh or frozen. They both work. A tablespoon of slivered almonds, and seven tablespoons of rolled oats. We figured out one half cup and an extra tablespoon is the equivalent of seven uh, tablespoons. And of course, if you don't have blueberries, you can use raspberries, you can use any fruit you like, you know, but we've got blueberries today and they work beautifully. Directions, crazy simple. Stir the ingredients together in a jelly jar with a tablespoon of water. Then after everything's in the jar, 
add one to two tablespoons more of water as needed to get the liquid just above uh, the oats. Leave enough room to stir or to shake. That's why we like to use these jars because there's plenty of room inside to stir it up with a spoon or to uh, put the lid on and just shake the daylights out of it. And you shake the jar, refrigerate overnight or for at least several hours and enjoy. And the recipe that we just did, did one, two, three, four jars that are about, uh, you know, just over half full and, uh, and, and that's what they are. So it's pretty simple and easy. Looks kind of funky on camera like that, but they're tasty. And, uh, and you can put, like I said, any fruit you want to put in here works well. So, and um, a great breakfast. Nice. So simple and easy. And for people who are plant curious, this is a way to start off doing something that's SOS free and easy to make. All three of these recipes are simple and easy. And the, the carrot salad's great for batch cooking uh, or batch preparation uh, there. So we'll go into that in just a minute. But uh, that's why the, the beauty about these, we're going to take the uh, um, other jars to work for the employees because uh, we know they're going to like this. So Mahani's going to say, oh, uh, the recipe makes all four. Oh, so the recipe only makes one jar. And then we quadrupled it to make four jars because we wanted extra for our for the employees. All right. So thank you. All righty. And now recipe number two. This is for the uh, wild huckleberry carrot salad. And this is a uh, recipe was sent in by Kisa Rinke. So thank you, Kisa. This is her first recipe. And uh, we're sending uh, all three of the people two eight ounce bottles of balsamic of their choice for having uh, their recipes on your broadcast chef. So thank you very much. Now, the ingredients, as you can imagine, really easy. Two pounds of shredded carrots, a head of sliced Napa cabbage, a quarter of a head of shredded red cabbage, some, uh, of course, a wild huckleberry balsamic. And she put in a bunch of raisins. You can use the dark or the uh, golden. I like the golden ones. I know you like them too, Chef. Yeah. Um, now, the raisins, when you put them in, they'll absorb the balsamic over time. So, and they'll get a little bit, they'll uh, rehydrate and plump up a little bit. So if you don't like plump raisins, just put them in before you're, they're going to be served. And that's super simple. Um, that's it. So that's super simple. Now, uh, directions are, you just mix up those ingredients and, and it's ready to go. Now, here's some notes. She says, I batch prepare my food on Sunday afternoons and never fail to make this salad. It lasts all week. At first, it was just carrots, raisins, and your balsamic, but I am now always trying to increase the color in my dishes, so I boost the nutritional value. I found adding Napa cabbage, a few orange blossoms from our grove, and some red cabbage added not only nutrition, but more texture and crunch. I hope you like this recipe too. And this made this great big bowl plus the small one and the bowl that Ethel ate before the broadcast today. So it makes quite a bit. Now we're not adding any balsamic to this. Of course, it would make it soggy. And we're not putting any raisins in there either. All that'll be done just as you're ready to eat it. So I imagine this would be about what? Three servings for somebody who's plant-based eating large portions that look right to you, Chef? Well, three, two, you never know with us. <laughs> Chef, this would be your breakfast out here by itself. Yeah. Could you eat that entire bowl? Probably not at this point anymore. But, <laughs> but you know, we like to we like to think big. You know, this whole idea of putting oats in balsamic, I'm not sure where it came from, but I remember doing a video a long time ago where I did that. Oh, fantastic. It's, yeah, I I'm remember not... when I did like a video, like seven recipes with California balsamic. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm pretty and sure. I wouldn't I be surprised. Like, I'm pretty sure I used the Simply Lemon in, in a blueberry overnight oat dish. I'm sure you did. 
Uh, yep, that sounds exactly right. So that's why the recipe is so good. It can be modified with any balsamic and any fruit. Well, I wouldn't put blazing habanero personally, <laughs> but hey, it's your balsamic. You can do anything you want with it. Could taste like crap, but no, but you can do whatever you want. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't put Gilroy garlic or sweet heat or teriyaki in there either. You're right, but boy, any of the fruit flavors would be good, unless you are making savory oats. Right, right, right. So anyway, so that's a great, great dish to, to do for batch, you know, and you can have this portion it off and take it to uh, work or school or anywhere you needed a good lunch. And it's going to stay, the crunch is going to stay all week long for that. So that's a lot of fun. So continuing our wonderful story, we finished, we stopped off with our, um, with the introduction that we developed our new flavor called Lemon Splash. This was, of course, 20 years ago. And Lemon Splash changed our little business forever because it became a flavor that the general public absolutely loved it. And we had to make huge quantities of it going to all of our festivals. And we would take six, eight, 10, 12 cases at a time, and we kept nearly selling out of it. And then we started developing more vinaigrettes with uh, several different flavors. And then eventually we said, well, why don't we start um, developing some balsamic vinegars with some fresh ingredients? We had several people ask us, why don't you have a garlic balsamic? We thought, well, there's no reason not to. We just need to take some garlic and we didn't know if we should just grind the garlic into a, a paste or if we should try and put it through some kind of filter. So we tried putting the, the mashed garlic into a coffee filter. Well, the coffee filters fell apart after you know a couple hours, that didn't work. Then we tried putting it into a cheesecloth and that was just, we thought overall too porous. So we finally said, well, what's thin, but allowing liquid to go in and out of it, but really strong. And we finally got to the answer, knee-high, no-nonsense pantyhose. We used pantyhose for years. And it turns out when a health inspector came to our facility and did their annual inspection, he asked me to make a batch of sweet heat. At the time, it was called Habarano. But we made that and we put the garlic and the peppers into a pair of pantyhose and put that into a bucket of balsamic and we massaged the pantyhose and you could see all of the garlic and peppers coming through the pantyhose. And he had to say, I need to double check with my uh, superior to see if this is a, 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 an all right you know, procedure, putting the, the garlic and peppers into the pantyhose. And two weeks later, we got a letter saying, you're good to go. And I went, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we've been given permission by the state of California to use pantyhose uh, to make uh, our flavors. And eventually we stopped using them. Do you know that I once heard from Dr. Furman, you could use pantyhose like to make almond milk when you didn't have one of those nut bags? That is rocking. And it's beautiful. But be sure not to get ones that have, we got the, the, the nude ones that, for the pantyhose that don't have any extra color in them. Because we were just worried that some of the color could leach out of the pantyhose. So that's why we used uh, and, what and we did use. Don't do it while you're actually wearing them either is a question. <laughs> well... I think I did not wear them during my singing telegram days, but I wore lots of tights <laughs> back then. <laughs> so anyway, so we developed um, our, uh, we started infusing balsamic flavors with some with pantyhose, uh, the garlic, we added peppers in there. The original sweet heat, like I mentioned a moment ago, was called habarano, habaneros, serranos, habarano. And we put that on the label and no one could pronounce it. Everyone said, you've misspelled habanero. And we just went, okay, we we're trying to create a new word uh, for habanero and serranos, uh, but it tasted delicious. It's the, what we call sweet heat today. And then we also did um, a dill mustard seed 
And because of that old flavor back then is why we have it today. And we did a rosemary balsamic. And the basil balsamic we did back then was a failed experiment. We made about 15 cases of white balsamic and we took basil leaves and we rolled them up into a long tube so we could slide the leaves into the balsamic and we let them sit there. And after about a month of sitting in the balsamic, we tried the basil. We put a little bit on a spoon and tried it. We said, there's virtually no flavor at all. That was a real bonehead thing to do, to make 15 cases of something, not knowing how it was going to turn out. So we took all those cases and put them into the back storage room, thinking, well, we'll, let, we'll figure out what to do with them, you know, a few months down the road. And six, seven months later, we said, you know, we're just going to take these cases to the local food bank and give it to them so they can, you know, feed the homeless. We've been giving uh, cases of our products to the local food bank and homeless shelter for 25 years. And um, we said, well, let's try a bottle just to see if there's any flavor in it. And we opened a bottle and we poured a little bit on a spoon and it was absolutely delicious. It took several months for the flavor to come out of the basil leaves and into the balsamic, which is really unusual because when we made rosemary balsamic, it was ready for sale in less than a week. Yet basil took three or four months to get enough flavor in it. And we ended up selling all those bottles, but then we didn't continue making it because we didn't want something that was gonna take you know, six months to make. Nowadays, we take fresh basil and we put it into the food processor and turn it into a paste and put that into the balsamic and you've got basil immediately. So that's the key is pureeing the leaves, um, whether it's basil or cilantro to do it that way. And again, you learn all these things over time um, and, and it's worked out beautifully. So let's see. And um, um so that's all we did uh, for all the, the flavors that we had. And then it was just, okay, now we have all of these um, balsamic vinegars flavored. We need to continue doing this. But this was well before we were, you know, knew anything about the plant-based community. And Chef, just today, I got a, a message from, uh, I think it was the young lady from Forks Over Knives. She's going to put the article that was done about Sweet Heat a year ago uh, online, and she wanted to do some follow-up questions. I don't remember if you know the young lady's name, Melissa or uh, Megan, something like that. But she called today asking about um, all your flavors and how we got involved with the plant-based community. And I said, oh, they found us. We did not find them. Someone saw us, you know, of course, at the festival, and that person told you about us, and then you called me, and boom, the rest is history. So that's a, that's a lot of fun thinking about how this has developed over the years, uh, because it's gone from one thing to another, to another, to another. And as a small business, you need to adapt. Uh, you know, hey, somebody throws a worldwide pandemic at you and shuts everything down you need to adapt as you have done, as we've both done. So that's, that's what happened over uh, uh, how we started infusing fresh ingredients into the balsamic was based at that time. This was probably just uh, uh, about not quite 20 years ago, probably 17, 18 years ago when this whole explosion of new flavor started and, uh, and it hasn't stopped since. So that's that. Okay, and finally, our last recipe is this wild huckleberry pudding. And this is something that's absolutely delicious. Um, this is by Ruthie Sater. Thank you, Ruthie. Uh, the ingredients are a cup of raw sunflower seeds or cashews. We use cashews in ours, and we uh, put them into the uh, almond milk for an hour to soften them. Uh, one and a half cups of plant-based milk of your choice, a tablespoon of the huckleberry balsamic, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, half a teaspoon of vanilla powder, 
uh, we didn't have any vanilla power rate, then we ran out. So we just used our normal vanilla. Uh, a tablespoon of date syrup, uh, agave syrup is okay as well. Uh, two tablespoons of cocoa powder, and then fresh raspberries for the bottom of the glass. Um, you can use fresh or frozen. And the frozen ones will add a little bit of, as they melt, they'll add a little bit of syrup to them. So that's kind of fun. And then optional is shredded coconut for garnish. So directions. In a blender or food processor, blend the seeds or the cashews, oat milk, balsamic, cinnamon, vanilla powder, cocoa powder until they're smooth. This can be several minutes depending on your blender. So if you have a really strong one, minute and a half, a weaker one, two or three minutes. You wanna get it really blended well. Place a few of the frozen raspberries in the bottom of a fancy glass, then pour the pudding into the glasses, leaving room at the top for the garnish. Top with more raspberries and any other garnish and sprinkle with a little bit of shredded coconut. Serve and enjoy. And this is our version of this one. We didn't put any shredded coconut on there because I personally don't like shredded coconut. I love fresh coconut, but not the shredded. Chef, you ever had uh, fresh coconut right out of the, out of the yes, coconut? Yes, because I remember oh. when we in culinary school and we had to learn how to open those suckers. They are hard to open. They are rock hard, but oh my gosh, fresh coconut right out of the shell is absolutely delicious and nothing like shredded coconut. I really don't like shredded coconut. I love fresh. When I was living in Hawaii, you could go to your local farmer's market and they would literally take the outside uh, husk off of the coconut and then you'd have the coconut uh, seed or shell and they would take this great big machete and whack it and uh, and then it would pop open and you could get the milk out of it uh, if you wanted that the coconut water and then he'd hand you this little funky little wooden spoon and I think they're about three or four dollars how much were they do you remember how much they were yeah about three or four dollars for this fresh coconut and you just start scooping out the fresh coconut and what a treat. So we did that uh, last time Ethel and I were um, on Maui. We went up country to the Pukalani farmer's market and got one of those. And, you know, always, every time we go there, we'll be there on a Saturday morning to the local farmer's market. So anyway, um, I want to thank um, Ruthie for the, the recipe here. That particular recipe whoop, made three of these uh, containers. Um, so obviously, if you want more, then you just have to double the recipe. But uh, it made three servings. And we'll take two of them to work uh, for the employees. And Ethel and I will enjoy the other one. So it's nice that we can share. The recipes generally always make enough that we can share with employees. And I know that they always appreciate whatever food we bring them. They'll eat anything we bring. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, that's funny. Do your employees like your product? Oh my gosh, the employees are using, the, when they have lunch, it's never unusual for them to bring a salad or whatever they're having to go over to, uh, we have two great big seven foot tall shelving units. And with about uh, five shelves on each one, and we have all of our flavors on three of these shelves, and each flavor has the little sample squeeze bottle of a three ouncer that says sample across the top. And they'll just pop open one and pour on whatever balsamic they want to try for their for their lunch. And so that's never unusual. Today, we had three different groups of people come in, which is unusual, uh, just for people who wanted to come in and, and pick up a couple bottles. Sometimes we only get two people a week. Today, we had three people this morning. So you never know who's going to walk in the door. And it's always a kick when somebody says, I'm driving on my way to Washington, going up Highway 101, and I wanted to stop by because Chef AJ said that you were here. And, uh, and they looked, Googled our address, and they just popped in the door, sampled a whole bunch of flavors, got a few bottles, and continued on their merry way and said, I actually went to their warehouse. So it's, it's funny to listen to people and how I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> I said, this is an give, old dumpy warehouse. Do you give tours? Well, Chef, the tour would take 
honest to goodness, less than a minute. If you walk in the door, you can see the shelvings on your left. If you walk straight back into the commercial kitchen that we have, it's only about 30, 40 feet long. And you walk through the kitchen to the other door and out the side and back to the front door literally takes less than a minute. It's an extraordinarily small facility. We have been there for 37 years and it was never designed for this kind of, of, of volume. Um, it's, it's too small for what we have. And we have a second warehouse about a hundred feet away that we uh, keep all of our inventory down there. But the commercial kitchen is in the original warehouse and, uh, and anybody is welcome to swing on by. And every time somebody comes in the door, we always give them a little sample. Even if they don't buy anything, we give them a little sample of something just to thank them for coming in. You know, so uh, people always get a kick out of getting a little, and even the kids who come in, we'll give the little ones, you know, little five, six, seven year old will come in and we'll give them a little bottle of something that we think that they'll like. So, so, so for Halloween, did you give 1.8 ounce bottles? <laughs> we did not. <laughs> we considered it, but I said, oh, they're a little expensive to give away to, to all the little kids out there. And they'd say, what is this? <laughs> and yeah. parents might say, uh, I'm not comfortable in my little kid having something that they know nothing about. So we did not do that, but it's a fun idea. Yeah. You think you'll ever have international shipping or satellite offices in other countries? Because that's the only complaint I get is people can't get your product outside the United States. Yeah, it's very unlikely because we're just too small of a company for international um, I mean, we can send out your Chef AJ sampler anywhere in the world for $27 shipping, um, which is wonderful. But when you get into larger bottles, like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, we sent three big bottles to Switzerland and the airlines would not allow us to put our bottles of, uh, of, of liquid onto their plane if I wasn't on the flight myself. So they just said, nope, we're not taking that on there. So we don't send big bottles um, overseas, just the Chef AJ sample because it's uh, less than two pounds and it's all plastic and we've never had a problem with that. So it's just too expensive. Uh, well, that you would know, be very three... expensive to order a bottle of vinegar if they had to pay for your flight as well. <laughs> The, the, we had somebody who wanted to get, I think, six bottles sent to Singapore, and it would have been something like $130 just for the shipping, which is just beyond silly to do that. I'm sure other companies get much better rates, but until we can find an easy way to send something, we can't send something to Europe because the uh, European Union requires us to... Um, do all this paperwork and, and submit it every month. And we're going to have no sales most months. And it's just too much time uh, for paperwork and, and red tape. So we just said, can't send anything to uh, United Kingdom because of Brexit. And Europe has the same issues with uh, bottles that are, I imagine, more than three ounces. So we're just not doing it. Well, you, maybe you'll have to just open up satellite offices. That's, don't hold your breath. <laughs> okay. Well, so what do so, you got on this? Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask you. No, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm answering your question. Uh, and your question was, hey, what's going to be the flavor next month? And the answer is we, um, we're we doing our pomegranate, which is a, a, a longtime favorite. I think we've been doing the pomegranate for easily uh, 15, 16 years. Uh, fig balsamic was the first um, fruit flavor boss we ever developed. And since people said, well, if you have fig, why don't you do pomegranate? That's a popular flavor. And so a couple of years after that, we did uh, pomegranate. So if anyone has a recipe that they enjoy that uses the pomegranate balsamic, please send it to orders at californiabalsamic.com. And if you have a picture of it, fantastic. If you don't, We'll take a picture of it and uh, after we make it and, and then use it. And if we use your recipe, you'll get two eight ounce bottles of the balsamic of your choice. And, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Wow. I don't think I've ever had your pomegranate, you know? 
Well, I know where you can get some harvest <laughs> festival. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, you know, because because it's a flavor I've tasted, but I don't know if I've tasted yours. So I'll put that in the mm-hmm. show notes that uh, the next, and when is one of those recipes do? do? Oh, uh, we like to get them uh, by the end of the month. So we have at least a few days to go over all the recipes that are submitted. Plus we need to go shopping and um and so by the end of the month, um, um, chef, any idea in your calendar, what, uh, what the date is for in December yes. for the first Tuesday? Let me see. I don't know. Well, let's see the first Tuesday. We're the second Tuesday because something happened. I think I had too many shows last week. I have you down for Tuesday, December 6th. Oh, good. That's plenty of time. So uh, any recipe by the end of November is fine. And even the first, couple of days in December, if you've got something that, but we prefer it to give us at least a week uh, beforehand. So that'll work out well. Nice. And Ethel, Ethel is going to be at the Pomona Harvest Festival the first weekend in December, the second, third, and fourth. Uh, so that's a fun show. The Pomona Fairgrounds is a easy place for a lot of people in the Los Angeles area to get to because it's right on I-10. Nice. Well, is she, she's not coming with you to harvest, is she? Oh, she will be. At, we're doing uh, almost all the shows together. Um, I think the only show I might not be at is the Pomona show because she has uh, a couple of friends uh, in the Los Angeles area who generally help her at that one. But uh, Ethel and I will be at both San Mateo and Sacramento over the next two weeks. So you'll see the world famous, my darling bride, Ethel Emma. Yeah. Will, will your mustard friend be at Harvest Festival? Oh, uh, that's um, Gary. Uh, he should be. He generally is doing uh, uh, I those. Uh, on the, I don't know why he will not come on the show. I just, he was just a little nervous, and I'm going to try to convince him uh, the error of his ways that you're going to be talking about your product. Gary, <laughs> yeah, he can do it from the neck do. down. He doesn't even have to show his face. He can even be on. He can just <laughs> not even show his face. Just show the product. Uh, do it in a, uh, behind a black screen out there. Only show the shadow. <laughs> maybe maybe you can do it with him so he won't be so nervous. There you are. Uh, I'll I'll try and convince him to do a show with you, Chef. Uh, wow. He's a super nice guy. And once he's done it once, then as everybody finds out, it's a no-brainer after that. It's it's so, it's, so it's easy. All right. Well, thank it is. you. I'll see you in December. I think oh, and that see you in September is the sign. Well, I'll see you in December. No, I'll see you in November. I'll see you next week. See- I'll see you next week on, on Friday, uh, the 11th. So or no, Friday, the 18th. Wonderful. Yep. So all that'll right. be a wonderful. I'll look forward to seeing you. All right. Always a pleasure, Thomas. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. My guest is Dr. Ruby Lathan. She healed herself of thyroid cancer. 